Hello and welcome to State Views, a continuing segment from the Daily Collegian in which we give members of the community a chance to express their views and opinions. My name is Mitchell Culler, and I'm absolutely honored today to be joined by United States Senator Bob Casey. Senator Casey, thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate uh, having you. Mitchell, good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to get started right off with an issue that I think is uh, really important, um, uh, and it's uh, sexual assaults on campus. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that you've been very active in the uh, Campus Save Act. Right. Uh, and uh, it's currently in the process of being implemented. Um, why do you think, th and or one of the things that key, component, key components to it is uh, sort of the uniform reporting standards. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this is something that's, that's so important to have uh, a as a uniform standard for colleges these days? Well, first of all, we should have some uniformity when it comes to how um, sexual assaults and stalking and, and that kind of violence um, is reported. There shouldn't be 50 different standards. There should be uh, one, one way to report, one way to keep data, uh, one national uh, effort that uh, allows us to give uh, students the information they need before an assault and engage in a lot of preventative activities, but then if an assault occurs, that individual should be given every, uh, not just uh, every right uh, that they should have to uh, 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 bring an action against the, the perpetrator, but, but also should be informed of their rights if they are a victim. I, I think in so many ways, though, we step back from this. When you think about what has happened on campuses, not just recently, but over a long period of time. Yeah. It's the ultimate betrayal uh, of a woman. In most cases, they are. It, it is a woman who's the victim. And we, we tell her, our society has told her for years, you should go to college if you can. If you go to college, you're likely to do better in terms of your income and your, your success over time. And we'll help you get there. We're going to try to help you have scholarships. We're going to make colleges, the college experience available to you. And then we send them on to campuses throughout the country, big schools, small schools, all kinds of different types of settings where they're often the victims of assault, uh, sexual assault, and then we comp you know, compound the betrayal or the insult by not making sure that they can have uh, the benefit of uh, tough rules, the benefit uh, that every uh, victim of assault should have. So Campus Save is a, uh, a bill that I introduced and was passed as part of the Violence Against Women Act. And that um, the, the regulatory process is taking place. Uh, they will be, the regulations will be done in November and then it'll be implemented next summer. So finally we're gonna have some, some provisions that we haven't had in place before to, to uh, protect the victim but also to say that we all have an obligation to be part of the prevention. Absolutely. Um, do you see any any challenges? Or I mean, obviously there's challenges, but what do you think is is the biggest challenge and how can we sort of mediate that in sort of uh, implementing such a, a broad uh, standard of identity for something that in a lot of cases is very difficult to uh, to deal with? Yeah, I think probably the biggest challenge will be the resistance from the institutions. Okay. <laughs> and that's okay. natural. Um, uh, I guess if I were running a college or university, I wouldn't necessarily want to uh, have to come up with a whole new set of, of standards. But, but I think in this case, I would hope that the, um, the, the colleges and university administrators, administrators or administrations, will look at this as an opportunity to deal with a problem in a way where everyone will be, every school will have to have the same information. In other okay. words, we say basically that they have to keep statistics on okay. sexual assaults, uh, instances of stalking, any kind of, any kind of violence on campus. So keeping good records and then telling um, the whole college community what the college will do in the event of, a, of an assault very specific procedures about a hand, how to handle things. Sometimes I've heard of stories over the last couple of decades where a woman is brought into a room after reporting an incident and she's in front of a group of administrators or, or 
leaders of the university and is cross-examined uh, in a way that's totally inappropriate. Um, and she has little in the way of representation, little in the way of information about her rights. For example, every, every victim should be told that they can, after reporting it to the campus authorities, they can also report it to lo- the to local police department. Police. Okay. They should know that they can do that. A lot, of, okay. a lot of victims don't know that. They should also know that they can seek a protective order. They should also know that they can change their academic mm-hmm. schedule and that they can have other measures of protection that can surround them after they've been a victim. So I don't think this is asking colleges and universities to do what they should do, uh, even without a new law. Okay. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned the sort of the, the bystander yes. uh, effect. Um, basically, that's saying that we should all, it's, right. it's on all of us uh, yeah. to... to or to prevent sexual assaults. Yeah. What sort of mindset, sh- or sorry. I was gonna say, now that's a national movement, that, right, just, yes. that, just that phrase, it's on us. It's on us. And I think it's on us in the sense that it's on us as males. That's a, that's a big, uh, obviously a big category of people. But on the college campus itself, uh, th- that national effort is consistent with what we're trying to do in Campus Save, to say that if you're at a party and you're a bystander, male or female, and you see something that you think might lead to an assault or is the predicate or basis for, for an assault, you need to act. Um, there are, and, and apparently the, the training that, that uh, is conducted is rather creative. Something, you know, sometimes um, simple acts by a bystander can break up the, break up the, uh, the dynamic which would lead to an assault. Um, and the experts have all kinds of ways that you can be, you can, be, you can help as a bystander without doing something that would put yourself at risk but but can can really prevent something from happening okay okay I think that's a really that's a really good initiative um, yeah yeah I, uh, as, as far as your uh, involvement with it it's on us um, do you think uh, the, the the bystander effect and sort of putting it putting it on us because that's a relatively new um, line of discussion right. in the conversation. Do you, I mean, how, how do you see that working moving forward? Well, first of all, I recorded a, a, uh, about a 15-second, uh, if not even, maybe not even 15-second message. That was pretty easy for me to do. I didn't have to exert much energy to do that. But the, the, the attempt the, the, or the, 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 uh, the effort here is to say um, elected officials, uh, it's on us as elected officials, but probably the folks that will drive it more will be uh, very prominent figures in our society, actors, athletes, uh, people that get have a lot of notoriety, have a lot of people paying attention to what they do. And if you have males saying that, uh, that it's, it's part of our responsibility, I think it, it helps to, uh, to broaden the, the universe of people that feel that obligation. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a rather effective way of getting, getting this message out that no matter who you are, whether you're a, a prominent person in the community or not, that we have an obligation, especially as, as males. I have four daughters, and two are out of college, one is in college, and one, one will be in college next year. And I, I want to make sure that for my daughters or the daughters of in any family, that they will be the beneficiaries of a better system and a system where everyone feels that they have an obligation. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a very uh, important issue that that we need to keep focusing on and keep keep the discussion going on. Um, I'm hoping to uh, also uh, get your opinion on something that, as as students, is is very important to us. Uh, uh, the current uh, climate of student debt uh, yeah. in the country it's obviously uh, risen a lot in recent years. Um, how look, you know, looking at the current trends, mm-hmm. what do you think is in store for us in the future? How, what's what's next? What's coming for us as students? Well, first of all, most students have, um, I think, in, in Pennsylvania, the average of about seventy percent of students have debt that hovers around, uh, and these are very much averages, but right, right, um, a little more than thirty thousand, about thirty-two thousand um, dollars, and there are probably some people that will see our interview and say, my God, I wish I had 32 minds much higher. Um, and and that's, right. there's certainly people who have much higher numbers. And there's, the federal government can't 
come in and and uh, come up with a magic wand that'll wipe away all debt. But there are some things we can do. Uh, for example, in the Senate, we've had two votes now, neither of which was successful. But we have to keep pushing this rock up the hill to keep <laughs> pushing the issue and keep voting on it. Absolutely. But it's legislation that um, Senator Elizabeth Warren and others have worked on, which is to say, why don't we allow students the opportunity to refinance their loans at a, at a rate of about 3.68%. The, 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 the impact of that for the average Pennsylvania student okay. would be about $4,000 over the life of that loan. Now, people might say, well, if it's 32 minus 4, that's not much. But it, it, it indicates that there are steps we can take to reduce that burden, all the while trying to think of, uh, of other ways to have a positive uh, impact. Um, but I don't think this is a, a challenge that we can legislate our way out of. I think if we pass our legislation, that will help. But I think uh, colleges and universities have to continually focus on better ways to help students get through this. Not that you can reach a point where no student has any debt. Getting everybody down to zero is probably highly unlikely. But any reduction, any diminution in that number can be very helpful because it becomes a burden when you leave school. You go to a great school like Penn State, you get a great education, you're in the job market, you're employed, but but yet every month you've got to come up with a dollar amount which impacts uh, the way you live your life and, and frankly will, will impact your ability to contribute to the economy. I mean, one the estimate on this bill in terms of the, the uh, reduction of the deficit, something along the lines of $14 billion of, of of deficit reduction, and it stands to reason if someone is, if their student debt is lower, they're probably going to be able to spend money on other things that will Absolutely. stimulate stimulate spending and grow the economy. Okay, okay, I think that's definitely uh, an issue that we as students. Is, is there anything that you think the universities could be doing? Uh, you mentioned kind of to alleviate alleviate that. Is there any steps that a, a, a university could take to to do that right now? Sure, I think just in any way they can, any way they can help on, on probably two broad areas, and you could probably identify a couple more. Doing everything they can to keep tuition down. Okay. But um, the the cost of college education has is probably the the area of uh, or, or the the segment of our of our society or the the segment of the spending we do that's grown. Uh, faster than anything in, that we can think of, faster than inflation, faster than wages, much faster than wages, faster yeah. than healthcare spending. One estimate had it this way: between um, about 1980 and 2010, roughly a 20-year a, a, a time frame, or, th or I'm sorry, 30-year time frame. Um, no, I'm sorry, it was actually a 20-year time frame, 89 to 10. Okay. <laughs> so over just 20 years, the cost of public colleges and universities nationally. That's none of the private schools, public colleges and universities. In 21 years, grew by 307%. Wow. Nothing else grew faster. Healthcare costs didn't grow that fast. Nothing grew faster. So I would hope universities do everything they can to keep tuition down, the, the increases down uh, as best they can. The second thing I would hope they would do is use, you know, use their endowments creatively. Okay. When you hear some of the endowments of some colleges and universities, billions of dollars, sometimes tens of billions, isn't there some way that they can use that endowment more effectively to help students? A lot of them do this. Right. A lot of them are very generous and very creative, but I would hope that that becomes um, the uh, the norm, not the exception. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. That's and uh, sort of seguing to you talked about the minimum wage. Yeah. Uh, as as an issue, uh, and I know you've supported increasing the minimum wage, uh, particularly in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's currently seven dollars and twenty five cents to uh, uh, ten ten. Right. What uh, what impact do you think that that will have on on the people working the, the minimum wage jobs, and how what sort of quality of life change does that does that really mean? Does that extra three dollars really mean for them? It's huge. It's it's one of the few things. When, when, you know, people look at the federal government now, and they're they're frustrated. They see dysfunction in Washington, things not getting done, partisan rancor. 
I don't need to, I'll stop there. I think it's a pretty <laughs> depressing list. Right. Um, but th there are some actions the federal government can take that will directly impact an issue. Campus Save, as a, as a piece of legislation, is going to positively impact the challenge of, that we have with uh, protecting women on campuses. That's an action where the federal government can have a big impact. Minimum wage is, is one of the best examples. If you pass a minimum wage increase, you, you automatically lift millions of people out of poverty or near poverty. But just consider this. Just consider children. If a minimum, with this minimum wage increase were, were, were passed, where you, 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 you raise it to $10.10 an hour over three years, a rather reasonable number, some people want it higher, you can positively impact 14 million children because they live in households where at least one person in that household is gonna, gonna get a raise. Okay. You can track, uh, you can connect, I should say, a minimum wage increase with better health outcomes for children, better school performance for children. Really? Okay. Better, better outcomes over a lifetime. If that child is, because of a minimum wage increase, is, is less likely to be hungry, is less likely to miss school, the impact on that child is uh, is over a lifetime. So this isn't some short-term, small group of American kind of impact. This this affects the economy because it drives consumer spending in a positive direction, but it can have a great impact on 14 million kids. Uh, that's that's pretty, pretty substantial. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah, um, looking at the firm side, is mm -hmm. there is do you have a recommendation for businesses as they sort of look to uh, handle the kind of the increased cost that, that they will be facing? Yeah, there are a lot of studies um, that have been done over a, a long time period where some will say that it'll have an adverse impact on small businesses. I think most of them say that it doesn't end up that way because here, here's what the benefit to a business is. Uh, they, they might say, well, if I have to increase my, the wages of my employees in this small business, um, that's going to be adverse to me. Um, I would argue if there is an impact there, it's short term, number one. Number two, the positive impact is your retention rate is, is more, um, is stronger. You, you retain your employees over, uh, over a longer period of time. So even if there is an initial uh, impact because you have to pay more, I think you're going to have both uh, higher retention rates and higher consumer spending, which helps Right, uh, your business overall. I mean, okay. two thirds of the economy is consumer spending. Every time we do something that helps consumer spending, gets money out of people's pockets that they spend in their local area, the biggest beneficiaries of that will be small business. Okay, that's that sounds good to me. <laughs> um, so, one thing I want to make sure we get to um, the you've been very vocal about the situation in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, recently Obama uh, has started uh, drone strikes and taking a policy of uh, providing military support and right. training but not and uh, sort of empowering the local uh, regions to kind of fight ISIS and by extension threats future threats themselves mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about about this policy I know that you have uh, sort of a bipartisan legislature uh, with Marco Rubio and I think that's very commendable uh, in this situation is there um, how, yeah how do you feel I mean, just kind of an overview um, first of all I support the president's policy okay. um, but I'm concerned about it because it's going to be difficult to achieve the, all the objectives that he outlined um, but I think number one I think they are achievable Okay. And number two is I don't think we could we should make a judgment uh, right now. You got a lot of people in Washington that even while he was speaking, they said his policy wouldn't work. Ten minutes after he spoke, they said it wouldn't work, and then they gave themselves a long period of time, like a week, and then said it wouldn't work. Absolutely. And they evaluate the airstrikes every morning like they're a baseball box score. I just think that's forget that it's unfair to the president. It's unfair to the policy. So I think we have to look at this policy. Uh, after a couple of months and keep okay. reevaluating it. But it's a challenge, but I don't think we have any choice. If you say that ISIS uh, or an entity like that is a threat, it's a terrorist organization, it's an army, and it's a, a criminal organization, it's a substantial threat, 
that we have to deal with. You have to be committed to making the strategy work. The military aspects of the strategy are very important, but I don't think they're going to be decisive. What's going to be determinative is a better word. What's going to be determinative in the long run over many months and over several years is have we kept this, what is now a 16-nation coalition, have we kept that together and has it been effective? Has, uh, because of that coalition, have economic sanctions and other pressure on ISIS cutting off their money, which is what Senator Rubio and I were right. working on sending a letter to Secretary of State John Kerry, cutting off their funding, has that been effective? Uh, has the Iraqi government uh, developed a government of national unity which has a direct impact on whether their fighters will fight ISIS. Um, if, if you're a Sunni uh, soldier and you don't feel that the Baghdad government represents you and will, will protect you, why would you be an effective soldier on the battlefield? So cutting off their money, keeping the coalition together, keeping pressure on them economically, coupled with airstrikes, and then finally the part that you referred to, having entities or nations in the region do the fighting. We need the Turks to help with the fighting, which right. they seem to indicate they're willing to do as of the last uh, 24, 48 hours. Having the Iraqi military, as I said, carry the fight in Iraq. And then the element that, that no one thinks will work, it seems like, but I, th I'm, I, I think will we'll work if we stay committed to it. Training a small number, it's not going to be 10 or 20,000, but training maybe 5,000 uh, Syrians who are in the opposition against Assad but who are nationalistic. They're not, they're not focused on jihad and, and what, uh, what some in the Middle East are focused on. They're focused on their country and Come governing on. their own country and having Assad lead. But they're, we have to vet them uh, carefully. We've already started that vetting. It's gone back. It's been happening for a long period of time. So they, they have to help uh, do the fighting in Syria. There's no reason why we should have American combat troops on the ground. Uh, when you have those elements in the region that can do the fighting. But we help them do the fighting with our airstrikes, our intelligence, and our economic pressure, and mostly keeping that coalition together like you've got to give a bear hug to them every day and keep them on the same page. Okay. Um, but I think the strategy can work, but it's very challenging. We shouldn't kid, kid ourselves about it. Absolutely. Is I, Part of the thing you talked is the sort of calling it a transnational criminal organization, right? Uh, is do you think that we're going far enough right now in terms of cutting off their economic, uh, their economic means that that criminal organization that that business? Yeah, no, we're not. We're not. Okay. We're, we're not enough has been done, but that doesn't mean that the president isn't committed to doing it. In other words, okay. I was happy when he gave his speech. My idea and Marco Rubio's idea about cutting off the funding was one of the four or five component parts. But but the administration has to prove that it's been effective um, in cutting off the money, and that'll take some time. Okay. It'll take a while. I think we, we, we have a, 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 it's a, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but it, it's helpful to, to get a sense of what can happen. We had sanctions imposed upon the Iranian regime over many years. When it, when it started, people said it'll never work or it'll have limited effectiveness. One of the ways that you make that work, sanctioning and cutting off funding um, or, or, or something comparable to that, is to make sure that, that all the countries in the coalition are committed to it right. and doing the daily work of enforcing uh, the rules. And we showed in the Iranian example that one of the reasons the Iranian regime is at the negotiation table on their nuclear program is because they were so constrained by the economic sanctions. We want to make sure that, that ISIS has similar pressure imposed upon it. And I think, in um, unlike the Iranian regime, I think putting major economic pressure on one terrorist organization, as big and as effective as they are, might actually be easier than it was uh, putting economic pressure on a big country like Iran uh, when we impose those sanctions. So in some ways we have a lot of experience in doing this, but we just have to be very determined on the strategy. Okay. That sounds really good. Um, th I, uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank uh, you. I really appreciate uh, you giving us the chance to talk to you a little bit today. And thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to see more views, be sure to check out the opinions page of the Daily Collegian, visit our website, or follow us on Twitter.
Have a great day, Penn State.